So this week, uh, we had a pastoral team retreat, and it was great getting to know each other, how we all work uh, and how we will work together and do a bit of dreaming together about what God wants to do in this place. Thanks for those that were praying for us. But on Wednesday night, we were in the Dananongs, and nobody popped the question like Matt did, uh, but we were in the Dananongs, and Wednesday night, we went out for dinner together. Now, we took, from where our accommodation was, we used our phones with the little map program to get to the restaurant, and we drove in two cars, and on the way home, Deanna and I were riding with Pastor Anna Kay, and we learned a lot about each other on that short trip. Yeah. Well, that's a, <laughs> it's a whole nother conversation. And you're about to see who was in charge. Now, I, I, I like the maps. I trust the map because I think the maker of the map probably is smarter than me and knows the territory better than me and everything. And I'm just gonna go with the map, right? All right, so it's dark and we're driving back. And the map leads us down a dirt road. Pastor Andy Kay's driving, right? And we're, we're going okay. And the map's telling me 1K, we're 1K away. And then we hit a sign that looks something like this. <laughs> Dead end road, no turnaround. We were going to go past the point of no return if we passed that sign. Now, I'm the, I, I trust the map, okay? So I would have pushed on. 1K, we can do that. But before I had a chance to say anything, I realized very quickly there was no conversation to be had. <laughs> yep, Pastor NK flipped the car around and said, I'm not going with the map, I'm going with my instincts. Yeah. <sighs> <Man>. <laughs> now, um, being the empowering leader that I am, I said, okay. And besides, he was driving, it's his car, and I thought, that's a battle I'm not gonna win. And as a leader, I know we choose our battles. So we, we, we ended up back in our accommodation, but I needed to let you know, Pastor Justin and John got there before us. Okay? So now you see the moral of the story. You see why I was so frustrated? Because I'm competitive as well. Anyway. I think we've all been there in life where we see this sign. We've all gotten to the places where we feel trapped, like there's no way out, like we are hopeless. What do you do when you get to that point, when you come to that sign and there's no way out? When I saw that dead end, no turn uh, beyond here sign, it reminded me of where we left the Israelites last week. Uh, and in case you missed it, uh, we've started a new series called Reality Bites, When Life Isn't What You Expected. And our, our aim in that is to learn how to respond when life isn't what we expected. And last week, we saw that God leads us down paths that are different than our plans. We learned that he does that for his purpose and that he has a design for that, and he's not gonna abandon us in those spaces. In case you missed that message, you can go to our website and look at the messages tab there, and also you can follow us on social media. You'll get notified of all kinds of things, so we encourage you to be following along there. So, God was taking Israel the roundabout way out of Egypt, not the shortest route. You remember that. The shortest route is green line. He's taking them the roundabout way, and last week, we left them here camped out at Migdal by the Sea. Now that sounds like a beach resort, doesn't it? Migdal by the Sea, yeah, yeah. So there they are at the beach resort, getting ready for the next instructions. And, and you'll find out very quickly that it was not a beach resort. So meanwhile, while they're there at the resort, back in Egypt, it says this. When word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds. What have we done letting all those Israelite slaves get away, they asked. So Pharaoh realized, uh, hang on, they're not just journeying three days to go and worship. Read the first 12 chapters of Exodus, you'll see that was the, the plan, that was what was communicated to Pharaoh. And he realized, hey, they're actually not coming back. They took all their stuff with them, and they took most of my stuff with them. So uh, I think they're not coming back. It was a realization. Pharaoh had made a decision in the midst of his pain. 
through the plagues and all the things that, that God was doing and showing his power through, Pharaoh made a decision and said, okay, I'm gonna let them go to ease the pain. Now the pain's gone and Pharaoh is having regret. He said, what did we do? We just lost all of this free labor. See, Pharaoh was convinced, but he wasn't converted. He could not deny the power of God and the work that God was doing and what he saw as God played out uh, his power and, and re rescued his people right in front of his eyes. He saw that unfold before his eyes, but he himself was not gonna become a follower of God. Maybe you're here today or maybe you're online today and that's you. You've actually seen the power of God all around you. And you would say, you know, there are things that are unexplainable that I, I, I really can't uh, give any other explanation for that other than there must be a God, but you wanna stop short. You're convinced, but you're not converted. You haven't taken that step to say, you know what, I'm gonna submit to that God that I know has to be real. If that's you, I would encourage you, stay with us through this series and see how it turned out for Pharaoh. Don't let that happen to you. Verses six through nine, we see Pharaoh assembling the army. Excuse me. By the way, in case you're wondering about my voice, I had a COVID test, it's negative. Um, so he's assembling the army to go after Israel. His aim was to capture them, bring them back. And they went after them. They finally caught up to them. And things seemed to be going well for Pharaoh at this point. Brings up the question in my mind, why did the wicked prosper? Pharaoh was a wicked man. He defied God. He denied God. And he was actually catching up with the Israelites. Why does that happen? And I think you, you ask that question in our world today. Why do the wicked prosper? Why are people allowed to do horrible things and atrocities? Why do we have countries where the people are, are abused and marginalized? <coughs> Excuse me. And it feels like God is silent. Like God doesn't even know that it's happening or at the bare minimum, God is not able to intervene. We must think he's powerless. But I want you to notice what happened here. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart to go after them. You see, God led the Egyptians to this place of apparent victory. He was at work there. Just as he had led the Israelites to camp there at the resort, he had led the Egyptians to come after them there where they were trapped. So God was far from unaware. He was far from silent. He was actually active in what was happening. And what we can learn from that is this. Following God may lead us to dangerous places. Following God is not a guarantee that life is going to be easy. Quite the opposite. It can lead to dangerous places places. See, Israel was exactly where they were meant to be. They were exactly where God had led them. Now they are trapped and there's no way out. There are mountains on both sides with rugged terrain that can't be navigated. There were Egyptian outposts in some of those mountains, both sides. In front of them was the sea, the Red Sea. Remember they're at the resort? And then behind them are the Egyptians. Friends, they're trapped. They are in a literally hopeless situation. See, when we're going along life's journey, even if we're following God hard after him, things are happening that we're unaware of. While they were camped out at Mignol, meanwhile, back in Egypt, God was working. The people were working, Pharaoh was working, making his plan, but God was working in that as well. Just as God was working at Migdal with the Israelites, he was working in Egypt on Pharaoh. Just because we find ourselves in a dangerous or difficult situation, it doesn't mean that we're outside of God's plan. It could very well mean that we're right in the middle of God's plan. I remember Mark chapter four, we have an account where the disciples were in a boat with Jesus and Jesus was asleep and they were following Jesus. They had done exactly what Jesus had told them to do all along the way. Storm comes up like a cyclone hurricane there on the ocean. Jesus is still sleeping and they were afraid and they thought, they, they, they asked him, don't you care if we die? They were right where they were meant to be, but they were in a storm. And you know the rest of the story, Jesus made the storm stop and they were fine and, and all of that. 
Thinking about Jesus himself as he navigated life's journey at the end of his life, his journey took him to the cross right where he needed to be for you and for me. If he had not done that journey, then we would have no hope. But friends, that was a dangerous place. The cross was a dangerous place. It wasn't a a, a healthy place for Jesus to go. But for you and I, he did that. We need to understand the danger does not mean we're outside of God's will. I remember a missionary that uh, was a part of helping send out to uh, uh, South Sudan. And South Sudan was a a country that was in turmoil and uh, Sudan, the whole of Sudan, lots of civil war and everything. And this guy said that he believed he had the gift of martyrdom and he came very close to having to live that out. There was a war and the base that he was staying on, uh, they they were evacuating all the, uh, the, the workers there and he didn't make the last plane out. So for a week, he was trapped on a compound where he literally spent hours and hours every day underneath a table because there were mortars flying over the house that he was staying in and there was bombs going off all around him. God delivered him from that. But he went to a dangerous place because that's where God was calling him to go to that dangerous place. So back to our story. So they're there, they're trapped, there's no way out. Let's see how they respond. As as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord. First response is great. (coughs) Excuse me. First response is great. They cried out to the Lord. Okay, they panicked, but then immediately cried out to the Lord. Let's see what happens next. Then they said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? Moving on. Next one. Yep, thank you. We said... Leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Why did you do this to us? What have you done? We told you so. Leave us alone. Let us be slaves. What we learn here is that when we feel trapped, our natural response is to blame. When we feel trapped, when we feel like we're getting in trouble, we want to know whose fault this is. That's what they were doing. They, they blamed Moses. Friends, this is a very, very unhealthy response when we're in trouble is to seek who we're going to blame because that makes us a victim. Then we become the victim and we are powerless then to do anything about our situation because we just gave the person or the situation all the power. We need to take ownership for our decisions. The the difference here is that they were not accepting responsibility. They were blaming others because Friends, they had enjoyed marching out of Egypt. If you go back and read the text, they had their fists raised as they were leaving. They were like, oh yeah, we're out of here. And probably all kinds of things going through my head that I won't say. Sticking it to Pharaoh, you know. (laughs) But now, they forgot that excitement and that energy they felt on their way out. And they said, it's your fault, Moses. Moses. You did this to us. We told you. I told you so. On and on and on. They were ready to trust God until things got hard. They wanted his provision. They wanted his blessings. But then when things got hard, they blamed Moses. They were actually complaining about God because Moses had led them exactly where God wanted them. Instead of looking up to God in faith, they looked back to Egypt and said, we're better off being slaves, better off in bondage to Pharaoh. You know what that shows us? When we feel trapped, we have short memories. They forgot what Egypt was really like and what it was all about. They also forgot God working to get them out of there and how he had gone before them and how miraculously he had worked in their lives already. See, when you forget God's promises, you start to imagine the worst case scenario. When you forget that God is faithful and he's going to take care of you, you imagine the worst case. These guys were sure that they and their children were about to be killed because Pharaoh's army was coming and there was no apparent way out. 
God will make a way when there seems to be no way. By the way, side note, Simon, yes, I'm old. I know that. But I'm talking about something that happened about five, 6,000 years ago. So that, that's older than that song was. So anyway, yeah. Back, back, back to the message. Israel's now in a terrible predicament. Moses was to blame. And unfortunately, uh, uh, unbelief has a way of bringing out or erasing from our memory all those things that God had done before. The instances we know about his faithfulness and the things we know about his word. When we're trapped, we have short memories. God had moved on their behalf to get them out of Egypt. He was leading them through the desert by the pillar, uh, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He had proven his power and he had shown them his provision. Now they were not trusting for his protection. Had he made a mistake? Has anyone ever felt like this? You ever felt trapped? Yeah, I see bunches of hands up all over the building. And did you get out of that situation? Yeah, yeah. Then you know what? You know that God will make a way when there seems to be no way because you've already experienced it. So next time you get trapped, stop it. Okay, stop worrying, stop fretting, stop getting anxious because when there's no way out, you know by your own experience, God made a way. You've lived it out. And in case you haven't been there already, or maybe you're in that trapped place right now, I, w- I want to share with you what Moses told them. Okay, we saw how they responded, but let's look at what Moses told them. This is how you can respond when you feel trapped. Now, you're going to think this is too easy, all right? You're going to say, hang on, you don't know my situation. You're right, I don't, but God does. And this is the formula God gives you when you feel trapped. It says this in verse 13. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Step one, don't be afraid. Why? Because God's on your side. As they came to their greatest moment of deliverance, they were full of distrust and fear. So when you feel trapped, you've got a choice, fear or faith, fear or faith. When you're feeling trapped, just let that drop into your mind right away. Okay, I'm trapped, I got a choice here. I can be afraid or I can have faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, tells us the right answer. We live by faith, not by sight. See, as long as the Israelites kept their eye on the fiery pillar and they followed the Lord, they were okay. But when they got their eyes off of him, they looked back. They saw the Egyptians coming. Then they were consumed with fear. They were not walking by faith anymore. They became frightened and started complaining. And that reveals a disappointing pattern for the Israelites. When things were going well, they would follow and obey the Lord. But at the first sign of discomfort, the first sign of difficulty, they would get afraid. And they would want to go back to Egypt. Reminds me again of Peter. Peter, when he was out on the sea and saw Jesus walking on the water, and he said, hey, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And then he was walking on the sea, right? He's, he's walking, he's dancing, having a party on the sea. And then all of a sudden he saw the waves, and then Peter, Peter's like sinking, right? right? He took his eyes off the Lord and looked at the situation. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, eyes on the Lord, not our situation. Let God worry about the situation. Keep our eyes on him. How much disappointment, how much discomfort does it take to make us unhappy with following God's will? Think about that. How much discomfort are you willing to endure before you say, I don't want to go on this path anymore. I want to go back. When things get hard, we get tempted to go back, to abandon our mission in life. Dare I say, even to let go of our freedom that God supplied for us when he saved us. And we want to surrender to our old defeated life, which leads us to Moses' next instruction. He says, don't be afraid. Then he says, just stand still. Okay. I I told you, you said it's going to be, you you would say it's going to be too easy, too simple. Don't be afraid. Just stand still. Here we learn when you feel trapped, stand still. 
Pastor Anna Kay, when we were trapped, you flipped that car around, mate. <sighs> Love you, guy. Stand still. You know what that means? It means you're acknowledging I can't do this in my own strength. I got to stop. Galatians chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, the apostle Paul writing to the, the, the people at the church in, in Galatia says, how foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? Human effort. We always resort to human effort. I always resort to human effort, friends. I'm admitting that to you too often. Fortunately, I've got people around me that always remind me, hey, 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 where, where's God in this? And I do remember that myself sometimes because the Holy Spirit will prompt me. But human effort. We're very capable people and we want to fix things. When we feel trapped, once we finish blaming others and we uh, uh, are done being afraid, we want to move into action if we don't just give up. We take matters into our own hands and Friends, more times than not, we make matters worse when we do that, when we take things into our own hands. Standing still says, okay, I see no way out of this. I know I can't do it alone. I must depend on God. Amen. That's what standing still does. It's important. And by the way, there's a, a spoiler alert here. You're gonna see next week that Israel actually did move into action, but not until it was time. It's important that we stand still before we go forward sometimes. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. Amen. So I read that verse this week, fresh and anew. I thought, wow, we live our hurried and frazzled lives in such a way that I think too often we don't see God. We don't stand still. We don't be still and know that he is God. How much more would we see God if we just stopped, slowed down just a little bit and waited for him to act? How do we do that? When you feel trapped, there's no way out, stop. Acknowledge to God that you don't know what to do. Ask him to make a way. But then tell him, when you make that way, whatever you want, yes, I'll follow it. And then stand still. It's that simple. Yeah, I know, it's too simple. While you're being still, then Moses says, finally, and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you. Just stay calm. Watch the Lord. When you feel trapped, watch God fight for you. That's what Moses is saying. He says, stand still. Now watch, watch, let God do this. And you get to watch, you get a front row seat and it's going to be exciting. Watch the Lord. You replace fear with faith when you're watching the Lord. You're standing still. Now you're, you're not trying to do it in your own strength. Now watch. How often do we miss what God is doing because we're not watching for it, because we're not expecting it? And I think too often, because we're so busy trying to do it in our own strength, our own power and all of that, that when God actually has intervened and done something, we probably even missed it and thought we did it ourselves. Watch God work. He's always working, but I think too often we miss it because we're not standing still and waiting for it. As I start to wrap up, I want to tell you a story that I heard this week, and it's about a man who lives this out day after day. And this man will be embarrassed that I'm telling this story, but that's okay, because he can handle it. You've already seen him this morning, in, earlier in the service. If you know Peter, he doesn't live life in a hurried, frazzled way. He actually believes that God will do what God says he will do. And he acts in faith. That's why he has said yes to God when God called him in Guinea to South Asia. And God's leading them to a place that just might be dangerous. There's no guarantees there. But here's the story. 
Peter just got his learner's permit to learn to ride a motorbike because their main mode of transport in the country they're going to will be a motorbike. So he got his learner's permit. And a couple of weeks ago, Peter, after he got the permit, he was, he was wondering, okay, I've got a permit, but I don't have a motorbike. And I don't really know how to ride. And uh, I, I've got to try to figure this out before uh, I get to South Asia. But Peter prayed. And Peter told God, I don't know anything about riding a motorbike and, and, and on and on. And then you know what Peter did? He stood still stood still. And unbeknownst to him, there was someone else who knew of that situation. A guy that's a bit of a bikey himself. And his thinking, without talking to Peter, was, okay, that's going to be their main motor transport. The dude's never ridden a bike and stuff. And and he's going to need some help. So this guy called Peter and said, Peter, you're going to South Asia and you need to learn to ride a motorbike. I'm gonna buy a motorbike that you're gonna have a lend of until you leave, and I'm gonna take you and we're gonna get all the gear and everything that you need to do this, and then I'm gonna help you learn how to ride a motorbike. Peter stood still and watched, and God was working in someone else's heart before Peter even made that need clearly known, and God provided. Friends, you should be clapping right now. That's, that's a God story. And friends, I'll tell you that because it is a God story, but it's also a story of someone who doesn't live that hurried and frazzled life to such a pace that he can't see God working. I respect and admire Peter, and I pray that I could be more like him in that way. Can I also give he and Guinea a bit of a plug in regards to their support? Because actually they treat that the same way. And they tell God about it and then expect God to do it. And you saw this video that we helped them make uh, today. And and I can promise you a lot of the talk about uh, how to give and all that, that that, that was us telling them, you need to say this, right? But Peter and Guinea have given this to God. They've made people aware of the need, but now they're standing still. They're watching, they're waiting for God to work. Not waiting for him to just drop the money out of the sky, but waiting for people to say, hey, we'd like to talk to you more about this and give those opportunities. So how uh, you, you might be an answer to that prayer. So now, how about you though today? Do you feel trapped? Are you in that situation where reality bites and you don't know what to do? There are no good options. 2 Corinthians chapter four says this. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the life of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. This is a New Testament example of what we just saw in Exodus of the Israelites. They're trapped, but they're not destroyed. We are trapped, but we are not destroyed. So if you're feeling trapped, it's okay. Because sometimes God leads us to dangerous places. So don't assume that that God has left you and abandoned you. We talked about that last week. So here's what you need to do. You need to stop the blaming. That's not gonna help. Even if it is somebody else's fault, get on with it. That's not gonna help you. It's time to stop blaming. Then remember what God has done in the past, how he has worked He's gonna get you through this one too. We established that earlier today. You've been trapped before and you're not now. Replace your fear with faith. Step into what God wants for you, even if it makes it even scarier. Then stand still. Do you have a place in your daily life to do that? Where you just come aside and you just stand still or sit still and know that he is God then watch, then you get to see it. And when you see it, praise him for it and proclaim what he did to others. Tell the story, like the story I just told you about Peter and and his faith and standing still. Tell other people when that stuff happens because that gives God the glory. One more passage and I'll leave you with this from the message translation. 
No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. Friends, that's my prayer for you today, is that you will claim that, and that when you feel trapped, you will replace your fear with faith. And you'll stand still, and you'll watch God work on your behalf. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this amazing account that we have where you guided your people, where you saw them, where you had led them to, that place where they were trapped. They were right where you wanted them to be, Lord, and it didn't make a bit of sense. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave them there. And as they're going to find out next week, Lord, I, I thank you for the victory you're about to give them. Lord, help us now. The days that we feel trapped, when our situation at work or our situation at home or our health crisis leaves us feeling hopeless, like there's no way out. Help us to not be afraid. Help us to remember how you've worked before so that we can have confidence that you'll work again. And Lord, give us the energy, the will to stand still. And Lord, help us be ever watchful to see you working in Jesus' precious name. Amen.